Welcome to Trending in Education. This is Mike Palmer with a special episode of Running It Back on deck for you. Tarlin Ray and I are going to continue running it back. And this week we're talking about Blackballed, which is a Quibi docuseries about the 2014 LA Clippers and the Donald Sterling fiasco. Very relevant to a lot of what's happening in the world today. We'll be back with more trending and education in the future, but for now, we hope you enjoy this episode of Running It Back. Welcome back to Running It Back, the lessons learned podcast about sports, media, the world around us. I'm joined as always by Tarlin Ray. Tarlin, welcome back. I appreciate it. I appreciate sharing space with you again. Yeah, and it was fun getting this show off the ground, covering the Last Dance documentary on ESPN, the Michael Jordan saga. Ten hours, five Sunday nights, uh, and we put four shows together, breaking it down. If you haven't listened yet, you should. Uh, we had a lot of fun doing that. And uh, we had such a good time, we were like, we, we can't stop. We got to keep doing this, clearly. And then... You suggested uh, a little something for us that we're going to be covering on today's show. So, so why don't you introduce us to what we're going to be talking about today? For those who watched the 10 hours of must-see TV, there were tons of commercials promoting a new documentary called Blackballed on this new app called Quibi. Not mm. Qbert. Yeah. Not Quince. Not Quince. Quibi. Yes. And so it covered the 2014 Los Angeles Clippers and the fall of Donald Sterling. I got to believe the only NBA owner to ever be kicked out of the league and forced to sell the team. So it was timely. It was interesting to go from seeing the Jordan documentary and then following a team in the 2000, 2010s. But then also uh, super timely have this conversation with just how crazy and whatever, what's going on in the world with George Floyd, Mm -hmm. Maude Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Mm-hmm. And you name the numerous, including Trayvon Mont, which is covered in this documentary, mm-hmm. the things that are going on. So you got a COVID that we were grappling with as you were uh, taking a moment to clap for our first responders as yep. you are close enough to be able to give those kudos and applause to people uh, that are working on the front line against the visible enemy. And now we've got a mixture of social unrest And for the first time, really people getting to see racism in its pure form. And it creates, you know, interesting time to be talking about blackball. And it could be, if you hear a little, I'm a little tired in my voice. It's sort of physical and mental exhaustion from what's happening in 2020, which is a really screwed up year. Yeah. Yeah. A lot in there. And the year has just been a nonstop tough ride for folks who are trying to understand what's happening in the world around us. And, and then part of the idea of this show is, you know, can we use media, can we use documentaries and sports narratives to help us try to make sense of all this? And uh, yeah, I do think Quibi notwithstanding, and we'll get some, some short hot takes about Quibi in a second, but Blackballed is super relevant to anyone who's trying to understand systemic racism and the impact of media and protests and all those kinds of things. This in the context of the Clippers in 2014, you know, fast forward six years to where we are now. Some of the seeds were already were already out there back in the day. And then also a really interesting story just around basketball too. So that, that is something where I was trying to put the Clippers team into context and try to understand some of the challenges they were facing and some of the ways in which whether it was Adam Silver or Doc Rivers or Chris Paul, DeAndre Jordan, the the players on the Clippers team, and more broadly, just players in the NBA, how they were responding to the Sterling situation was pretty uh, profound and relevant, both as a thing to think about nowadays, as protests are, are really central to a lot of what we're thinking about, but then also looking back to the last dance where you know, Jordan was notoriously not political and notoriously not protesting, and he got beat up pretty good about that. So, so yeah, I think there's plenty of directions for us to take in terms of talking about blackballed, and and then obviously the George Floyd 
Brianna Taylor, you know, all the names over the years, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, the names just keep on going. Obviously, that's something that is affecting everybody nowadays. So where do you want to go, man? I want to start with something lighter. Let's talk about- Yeah, please. What a disaster a launch. $1.8 billion to launch yeah. an idea where they're forcing, they believe, and now granted, it's bad timing because they wanted to force you into form factor. All you can do is watch your content on your phone. Yeah. Short clips, so seven minutes. So you can do this while you're on the subway. You can do yeah. this while you're standing in line and get all the content you need. Mm -hmm. One, why $1.8 billion? Are you kidding? Why yeah. <laughs> never heard of like starting small and seeing if people really like it? Never really asked them if they like it. Yeah. Two, they force you on the phone. No one's doing a lot of traveling and they had no thoughts of ever being able to release the content a la Netflix or having an app on smart TVs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Please continue. Yeah. There's, there's three. I won't be all negative. It, it's not a hard watch. But three, why get rid of binge watching? Why? Right. Mm -hmm. And the first time I download Quibi, and maybe it's because they had stacked up six episodes, I could watch six in a row. It's seven minutes. So it's right. like watching show and have, like you can power through it. Don't feel like yeah. you're, you're yeah. mindlessly doing it. Yeah. But then it's like, and the next episode is going to come out tomorrow. Oh, come on. Really? Right. This is ridiculous. Right. And the only reason I powered through is because I knew we were going to do this and it was interesting content. But I won't watch anything else. I've done my free, I got my 14-day yeah. free trial. Right. And well. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, I was just my context for Quibi. I kind of was, was working around the edges. So the first time was walking my boy, Matthew on a stroll. I was strolling the boy in the stroller and I was listening to Quibi like it was a podcast. So it's a oh. video documentary, but I was listening to it. And uh, there's another word uh, for, for, for that. It's called the podcast. So like this whole thing What's it could have just, it's just called a podcast. You could have just delivered oh, to me it. the same level of value <laughs> by just giving me a podcast version of it. And then when I got home for the second uh, set that they released, the, uh, the second, I guess, half hour-ish, 40 minutes, I was able to cast it to my Apple TV from my phone. So I had to kind oh, of- Oh, I could have done that. Oh. I kind of like hack around to get back to the viewing experience. They should have just freaking built for me to begin with. So- don't make it so hard on me. Make it a little frictionless. And especially if you're spending 1.8 billion, I have an idea, make it frictionless. Understand the context in which I'm gonna to wanna to consume your shows. That being said, if this was like a 90 minute Netflix documentary, HBO documentary, uh, Showtime documentary, I think it would have been pretty good. And I think it would have flowed fine. If the, I found the, the sort of arbitrary seven minute format to just be awkward. It was like right by the time it was getting my attention, I had to go through a, 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 a jerking around when also I would have just listened to a 90 minute podcast about this, you know? So, so wait. Totally great, great, great content, by the way. It's well done, but yeah, I don't get it. Yeah. But that being said, <laughs> the, the body of work, and I would say for our listeners, it is worth watching or listening to 100%. Or access to this content, I do feel like it, it armed me with some interesting context and information that I never really had before, which is part of what I liked about The Last Dance. I remembered the Sterling, Donald Sterling case uh, when it came up and when, when he lost ownership, but if you would have quizzed me before watching Black Ball, I probably would have gotten several questions wrong. I would have misremembered some aspects of the story and then also uh, just understanding the, at, at a personal level, the, the primary players in the narrative, the players on the Clippers, Doc Rivers, their coach, other leaders within the NBA, Adam Silver was just starting as commissioner. All those data points, even the context relative to Trayvon Martin, which was two years prior, I probably had fuzzy memory about those things. And now I can talk about them with some depth. And maybe that's what we could, could start moving towards next. And then also, I just really, I was mentioning you when we were coming into this, part of why I love uh, running it back on these old things is that as a gentleman who's maybe getting on into my middle years, I don't have encyclopedic memory of all these seasons. And then you watch the documentary and it brings it all back. They had a super team. The, the Clippers were really good. They were a contender. And, and then this happened during the playoffs too. Playoffs? This happened playoffs? during... 
during the playoffs while they were playing a young Golden State Warriors team, Steph Curry and Clay Splash Brothers on the rise. It did take me back. There was some amazing basketball happening in the first half of the, the 2010s, not just the stuff that I actually remember as a, as a middle-aged man. And then taking me back, it was a fascinating context when the Sterling thing broke and then understanding almost from the journalistic perspective, how do you tell the story of how this thing broke and how, how the NBA responded and how Sterling responded. So we should probably set the scene to make it simple. Please, we'll give please. the quick cliff notes. Please. Los Angeles Clippers have been one of the worst franchises in NBA history. Donald Sterling buys a team when they were in San Diego for what at that time was very, no, not a lot of money. Real estate guy. So he's a buy and hold guy. So he buys something, buys the building, doesn't put a lot of work into it, and just continues to accrue the benefit. The asset gains value, and you get recurring revenue coming in. That's sort of his game. Right. So the Clippers are awful. And I grew up, as you know, Lakers fan, 80s. I mean, no one went to the sports arena to watch Billy, the Clippers. Billy Crystal, maybe, right? Billy, Billy Crystal. Crystal and, like, two of my buddies who claim they're diehard. I'm like, I just don't understand why you would ever do that. Oh, everyone liked the Lakers. Like, and? So Clippers are terrible. And they would go through in the documentary quickly. They'd walk through draft picks that refused to come to the Clippers. They went to Europe, they went to Europe Danny Ferry. Danny yeah. Manning, who's all world and tears ACL, never the same. The, ca- the candy man? Old <laughs> Quandy, right? I mean, Ola, on. Ola candy. Yeah. <laughs> so we then fast forward and you get to 2009 drafts where they finally get it right and, and they draft Blake Griffin. Mm-hmm. DeAndre Jordan's all already on that team. 2011, which still pisses me off to this day because mm-hmm. Stern nixed a trade from Charlotte to the Lakers. Right. Chris Paul magically ends up on the on the Clippers, 2011. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They had a squad. Actually, they said that the moment that the Clippers came into everyone's conscience was in 2010 in one of Blake Griffin's first games when he caught a pass, a bounce pass, and might have had one of the most ferocious dunks over one of your Knicks players. Yeah. And so it was your Knicks that mm-hmm. helped – bring them on the rise and then you get Chris Paul to come and they, it's lot. Now we let's fast forward. It's 2014 lob city. Yeah. And that was a cheap shot, but I'll allow it. Yes. Continue. I, did, really? I just, yeah. I felt like it was still, yeah. I said it just in the same. It's all right. It's all right. It's all about, it's all about acceptance and empathy these days. Yeah. yeah. So all the while we know who Donald Sterling is as a person, he's getting sued because of discriminatory practices in his, mm-hmm. in his apartment buildings mm-hmm. and he just gets away with it. And he also is just sort of a creepy old dude. He's yes. a guy that when players come, they feel uncomfortable around him. He'll bring mm-hmm. people into the locker room, men and women, to say, look at these black bodies, and just is mm-hmm. a really strange mm-hmm. guy. Yeah. And then we get into, as you said, the Lob City year where the Clippers are one of the best teams in the league. Yeah. No one wants to play them. Mm-hmm. As you said, it was what, J.J. Redick, Paul yeah. Crawford, yeah. Allison off the bench, DeAndre mm-hmm. Jordan, Blake Griffin, mm-hmm. Chris Paul. Like, that's a squad. Matt Barnes. Yeah, yeah. Before exactly. Matt Barnes, they had, they had all, little... Before Matt Barnes, all he wanted to do was fight. <laughs> yeah, but they had some toughness. Doc Rivers had come. He Doc had Rivers. success with Boston beating the Lakers. <laughs> that was a cheap shot. <laughs> <laughs> so, Let's be clear. But, and then he was able – I mean, and that was a big move for him to go to the Clippers – and there was, there was a little bit of championship buzz around this team. Obviously, putting it in context, the dream team is happening at the same time. The Heat, the big three of yep. the Heat. And then San Antonio was strong. Kevin Durant, OKC. Westbrook. OKC is still a super team. But they had a puncher's chance, particularly if you look at the depth of this roster. They, they were ready to get frisky that year. And, and then this happens. And the, what happened? Tell us. And again, I was listening to this while walking the boy through Prospect Park, so my recollection may not be 100% rock solid. But there is a tape, a tape that is released on TMZ of a recorded conversation of Donald Sterling with his significantly younger girlfriend, mistress, V. v Stiviano, born Maria Vanessa Perez, also known as Monica Gallegos, Vanessa Perez, and Maria Valdez. So she had many names and she records Donald Sterling. And what does he say? Basically, you're making me look bad by posting 
pictures on Instagram where you're associating with black people. And one person that she was associating with or that she posted was Magic Johnson. And I love Jamel Hill in this. She said, if you don't like Magic Johnson, it's like saying you don't like old folks, puppies and seals. <laughs> so he basically blew it, like took it, not only you don't associate with him, but don't ever put that in my face or put me in a bad position where my friends will call me talking about you, basically saying, why do you have your girl associated with black people? Right. You can do it in private. You can love them. You can love them when no one's looking, but never out in public. And then it gets worse, right? So we're not going to, I don't know how much we want to talk about. Say there's a bad take. And yeah. It's not about sexual exploitation. It is unmasking a bigot, a racist, and someone who is showing his true colors in a private setting with his girlfriend. A, a plantation mentality too about his team, right? Was the sure. other sensibility where he's basically saying, I give them food, I put clothes on their backs. There's a lot of really incendiary language around how he as an owner, it's his team, it's his league, they play for him. And there is this sense of entitlement and privilege where he even doubles down on it when he gets a chance to back out on on a follow-up interview with anderson cooper he doubles down and he attacks magic again he is the opposite of remorseful about this he feels as though he did nothing wrong he's a really terrible public figure oh and it, it's mind-boggling how bad he is so the show is worth watching just to be reacquainted with just how horrifically bad he was Cringeworthy listen and cringeworthy interview, right? And, cringeworthy and listening to the audio and then cringeworthy listen to the and, and he still at the time owns the team. You know, and meanwhile, Adam Silver, which is probably the next place to go, comes in. The players themselves and Doc are totally shook, right? So, I mean, we at least have that element of the reaction. You know, Chris Paul, I thought, was pretty good at telling the story, at least from his own perspective. Yep, you mentioned a few people already. So, Doc Rivers, mm -hmm. Chris Paul... Yeah. And Adam Silver. Mm -hmm. And I thought in each of those cases, it's a master class in leadership. So Doc Rivers, he was an untenable position, black man who already knows ownership, who had experience, really interesting experience ownership during the 2013 free agency period when he wanted to bring in and had already secured JJ Redick. And at the last minute, Donald Sterling ends up nixing the deal because he didn't want to play that, pay that much for a white player. It says a lot about ownership. So you got Doc who needs to go in and make sure he's leading a team, be empathetic, hearing his players, not forcing to do something that he knows he wouldn't be willing to do, but also trying to keep their, their eye on the prize, which was winning a championship because Lob City was in a place to do that. Yeah. You got Chris Paul, who's the leader of the team, and also – president of the players association at the same right. time right right now not only making sure he's keeping his emotion in check he's got to show up as a leader but then also representing the league the players mm -hmm. against an owner who everyone knows early on should no longer be a part of the nba and right. he's got to not only have this public face talking about what's going on in the court but privately working around the clock to represent the players and figure out what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. And then last is Adam Silver, who has been in the NBA forever. He learned mm -hmm. at, he learned at David Stern's feet. He, mm -hmm. He's been, you know, connected to these owners for years. As he said, he's known Donald Sterling for over 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. And now he's two to three months into his job and this crisis lands in his lap and he has to make a call. Mm -hmm. He has to be, the moral leader. So right. I just, those three individuals in particular, as you know, we like to call back to moments of lessons that we can learn, moments where individuals step up in times of crisis. I, said, I think it just says a lot about who they are as human beings. And I just give a lot of credit to what Adam Silver did, which is ultimately giving a ruling that it's a lifetime ban for Donald Sterling, which never would happen for an owner. Chris Paul for, you know, at the end of the day, even though they lose in the second round, he puts it on him. And 
doesn't ever blame what happened on the outside, even though he had more to shoulder than anyone else. And mm -hmm. for Doc, for getting his players to show up, but never putting himself in a position where he was bigger than them, it was almost like we're all in this together. So th those are those three individuals. I just it's, I I appreciate the, the documentary more than anything else. Getting a chance to see them and how they were. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I would add a fourth, and that would be Matt Barnes for coming up with the protest that the Clippers wound up agreeing to. It did bring me back. Game four in Oakland, the Clippers come out. Everyone's trying to figure out what are they going to do. They come out wearing their shirts on inside out. So they're just wearing red shirts and they all throw their Clippers jerseys at center court to clarify that they're not playing for the Clippers team. They're playing for uh, themselves as, as men who are responsible for what they they do in their career and felt felt the need to be there but uh, i'm only half kidding you know because i actually think the no i i agree the, the the chemistry on that team actually was pretty good that's why i do think they probably had a shot at the championship honestly is my, is my perspective on this because the level of teamwork necessary to withstand this this sort of unprecedented jolt is definitely evident even to this day and they wound up beating a tough Warriors team. Granted, they were expected to win that series. And then they went out in a tough series against KD and Oklahoma City. But they very easily could have won that series. So you never know what could have happened. I think you're right to treat this as a lesson in leadership. And yet, yeah, it's also a pivot for the NBA, right, in, in two ways. It's following through on the Trayvon Martin protest to the players feeling empowered to stand for social causes, particularly Black Lives Matter related, you know, the, the assault on young black men in America, young, young African Americans just in general, but, but young boys really who are kind of reflective of the, the people who really comprise a large part of the NBA. The players feel more comfortable with those protest moves relative to Jordan. And then with Adam Silver, Adam Silver's move, suddenly the commissioner is in support of the players. And I think it really does fully manifest a shift from the owners really owning the league to the players now being empowered to lead in ways that, that you don't see in other leagues. It's an interesting contrast too for the NBA relative to say the NFL. You're hitting on something as you talk about that moment, what enabled the NBA to move. It's just not the audio itself. There are other factors that go into it so if you compare it to what's happening today you know there's a swift end to Donald Sterling's story oh no he had to sell his team for over two billion dollars and Donald right. I feel bad for him he's gonna walk away with a billion right so but there's an end to it so you can root out that racism mm -hmm. what's happening today you can't put a tidy bow on but I do think there's a parallel back in 2012 Trayvon Martin it's the death of another black male. The heat protests on the court or wore hoodies in the court to support Trayvon Martin and some other players around the league. That sort of went, it was almost like the, the way that people are covering, covering COVID right now. It was mm -hmm. hot for a moment and now all of a sudden no one's talking about the fact that everyone's outside again and that mm -hmm. we should be seeing a spike in COVID-related illnesses. Mm -hmm. So what happened in 2014, the, the the equation, the special mix was Donald Sterling was on tape mm -hmm. that everyone can hear and or see. So we heard it this time. Money was leaving. So people were fleeing the Clippers. Brands that are associated with advertising Clippers are fleeing out of the Clippers, are fleeing the NBA. And protests were happening, not just once of a silent few, but broadly outside the Clippers, Clippers Stadium, mm -hmm. Golden State. To the point where Garcetti, the mayor of LA at the time, and then in conjunction with the mayor of Sacramento, or mayor of LA calls Donald Sterling to tell him, basically tell him he needs to sell. Right. So super interesting to, to look at that versus what's happening now. Floyd, it was something on tape. So you mm -hmm. actually have, people don't believe racism is out there, but you actually can see it in, in real life. Mm -hmm. You have money and individual brands that realize they can't associate with 
either you can't be quiet anymore, it's not enough to put a BLM or Black Lives Matter hashtag out, need to do something. So mo money is mobilizing. And the protests are not a silent group, but across, this, across the country. So there won't be a tidy bow, but it's just an interesting time that really post being on high with the 10 part series with the last dance and saying we're going to watch black ball it's really it was really interesting to be watching spending only 84 minutes so yeah. no one can do it 84 minutes reliving what happened with the clippers mm -hmm. powerful stuff closing thoughts or those are they those are they mm -hmm. yeah so we'll keep running it back obviously some stuff's just left open-ended you know not really the resolution that maybe we would want, although hopefully some some semblance of justice is ultimately going to happen here, and certainly folks are going to continue to assert their right to protest, and we'll continue to track it. And I think we're going to continue to run it back too. I, I think there's talk about a certain Allen Iverson press conference in our future, so so be on the lookout for that. And uh, Tarlin, as always, uh, thanks for joining. I always love being back to run it back. We'll be back again soon. Thanks, everyone, for listening.